So, how many supernovae does it take to make all the yarn in our Milky Way galaxy? Well, our Milky Way galaxy has a total mass, that's of all elements, of about 6 by 10 to the 10 solar masses. That's mostly the mass in all the stars. Basically, you work out how massive a typical star is, count the number of stars, and you get this answer. However, in our Sun, we know that the mass of iron is only about 0.0012, so 0.12% of that. So the mass, that's the mass of everything. The mass of iron is going to be about this times 6 by 10 to the 10 solar masses, which comes out as about 7 by 10 to the 8 solar masses of iron. So that's how much we have to make in our own Milky Way galaxy. How many supernovae does it take to make that? Oh, notice that for this we've assumed that the fraction of the Sun is typical of all the stars in the galaxy. That won't be quite right, but we're only off to a rough estimate here, and it won't be too far wrong. Some stars have more iron, some have less, but it's going to be roughly about this. Okay, so how many supernovae? We know that the type 2 supernovae generate 0.1 solar masses each of iron, whereas the type 1As generate about 0.6 solar masses each. So you might think that type 1As generate six times more than type 2s, but it turns out the type 2s are actually more frequent. These are about three times more common. So you factor that in. This, these ones generate six times more, but these ones are three times more common. It turns out that overall, the type 1As generate twice as much as the type 2s, so type 2s produce about one-third of the iron, and the type 1As generate about two-thirds. So that's all we need to know to work out how many of each type of supernova there are. Let's look at the type 2s, for example. So the number of type 2s is going to be about this mass. 7 by 10 to the 8 solar masses times a third, because only a third of the iron comes from the type 2, divided by 0.1 solar masses, that being the mass produced each, which comes out as about 2 by 10 to the 8 supernovae. So about 200 million of these type 2 supernovae would be needed and a somewhat smaller number of type 1a supernovae. That sounds like a lot of supernova, 200 million supernovae in our galaxy. However, you have to bear in mind that our galaxy has about 4 by 10 to the 11 stars in our galaxy. So that's only a very small fraction, less than 1 in 1,000. Is this actually feasible? Could we actually expect one in a thousand of the stars in the galaxy to go supernovae over the age of the galaxy so far, which is probably about 10 billion years? Well, this is a bit complicated. We can come up with what's called a Hertzsprung-Russell or HR diagram. What we do here is we plot how bright the stars are, the luminosity, against the colour. So these are red, blue. Now, when stars form, they sit on a line in the diagram, something like this. So you get the very luminous blue stars and the faint red stars. So these are the blue giants and the, and the red dwarfs. With the sun, I know, somewhere in the middle here, somewhere like that. The stars up here might be, say, ten times more massive than the sun, but they are ten to the four times more luminous. To produce that enormous luminosity, they have to burn very fuel very fast. So you just got to imagine they've got 10 times more fuel, but they're burning it 10,000 times faster. So these things don't last very long. They last 1,000 times less. So the sun, like our 
It's not like our own sun. It has a lifetime of about 10 billion years. These ones here might only have a lifetime of 10 million years or even less, which is, you know, blink, blink of an eye to an astronomer. The stars down here, the red dwarfs, last trillions of years. None of them have ever died because the universe isn't that old. Now, it's these stars that are going to explode to form the type 2 supernovae. Once they come to the end of their life, they will move over, become giant stars, move up to this part of the HR diagram, and then disappear rather rapidly. So as time goes on, we steadily lose the stars up here till the HR diagram starts down there. That would be if no new stars are being born. But in practice, in galaxies like our own, new stars are being born from gas clouds, and so this area is constantly replenished, as is this area. So as time goes on, the number of stars up here go and explode, so it keeps fairly constant. Whereas down here, you're building up more and more and more stars. Each new generation just stays around and doesn't explode. <coughs> so if you do the calculation, you can work out the ratio of the number of stars up here to down there. It turns out that for reasons we don't very well understand, massive stars are born far less frequently than low mass stars. Whenever you get star formation regions, the ones up here are very rare compared to the ones down there. The ones down here keep on piling up over the billions of years of the... Uh, 10 billion years or so of our galaxy's history. These ones die almost as soon as they're formed. And you can add that all up, factor in what you think the star formation rate against time was, factor in the ratio of high mass to low mass stars, and it comes out about right. That you would actually expect about one, in, one supernova over the last 10 or 12 billion years for every thousand stars that are still around today. So this kind of works. <laughs>